Our first writer tonight uh, is Katharina Vermet. I was so thrilled when, when Kate's book, North End Love Songs, hit the shortlist for the GGs. I think I was almost as thrilled as she is, but I couldn't vouch for that. Um, I think the whole city heard a big whoop, and uh, those of you who are paying attention will have noticed that the Free Press actually had poetry on its cover, <laughs> possibly and probably first and last time in our collective imagination, but we can always hope. Kate, stay busy. Uh, it, was a, it is a, a brilliant, uh, searing, gorgeously written book, and uh, Kate is equally uh, gifted as a, a reader. Uh, I had the unbelievable honor of actually presenting her at the GG's at Rideau Hall, and, uh, and I was, um, my, you know, I could hardly fit into the building. I was so puffed up and excited. Uh, and she did one of the most grace, graceful and gracious um, thank you speeches that I've ever heard. Um, so I know that you're in for a real treat tonight. So I would please invite you to welcome her to the stage, Kate Vermet. some water. They were keeping this away from us. Oh, it's always important to get water. How are you doing? So, oh. I love this space. It's such a beautiful space to share words in. I was here just a few weeks ago for Wine and Words, another wonderful literary event that's become a part of our calendar. Um, and uh, it was great to hear so many voices, and I'm honored to be here tonight with Lorna and Patrick. Um, I want to thank everybody, absolutely everybody, the Writers Festival, these wonderful people here, who the Canada Council for the Arts, don't call it Canada Council of the Arts, they will correct you, they will send you emails, they will make sure you understand every time you go up to a podium and they're in, in your presence. I only made that mistake once. <laughs> um, so yes. So I am going to read for 13 minutes. You can time me. We'll see if I make it through. I tend to rattle on a little bit as I read from my, my book here, just because it's, it's, a, it's a sad book. And I hope it's not, it doesn't stay in sad. I, I want it to be about going through the sad and finding, finding the pretty pictures. Uh, and it is a pretty picture. It is a beautiful neighborhood. It, it is a place I am proud to be from. Um, and this this beautiful cathedral here in the background, it, this was the one you were talking about, right, Lorna? This is, the Lorna and Patrick used to live right around this. This is right by St. John's Park on Redwood in Maine. So we're, we're quite a North End presence here today. Uh, whenever I read, I try to read a little differently. So today I'm going to read your par the park poems. One of the little things that comes through the book is I, um, I like to take little metaphors and beat them with sticks until they submit. Um, and one of those, one of those um, images and metaphors I use is a park. There's beautiful parks sprinkled around this place. Um, so the first one here is Pritchard Park. She sits... On the far park bench, exhales cigarette smoke and cold. Her fingers trace the rough lines others have carved into the wood. Her youngest daughter calls, wants to swing, wants to be pushed until her feet kick the sky, until her little face hurts from wind and laughter. She stubs out her half-finished smoke and stumbles toward the play structure where her oldest daughter thumps her boots across the frozen playbridge. She likes how the sound, how the hinges have a special song in the winter. The first part of the book really takes place when my daughters are young and when we moved back to the North End after an absence and I was really confronted by 
by the childhood that I left there and that their childhood as it was unfolding um, in that same place. So I liked to watch them when they played in the park and smoke, but really far away. It wasn't toxic or anything. <laughs> park girl. She runs barefoot in the park, her hair and her face brushed aside with a quick chubby palm. Daylight dances on her pure dark skin as she rattles off verses, buries caterpillars in the sand, calls the weeds flowers. She would stay there forever. Make the teeter-totter her dinner table, cuddle up to the sleep, cuddle up to sleep on a swing, and sing lullabies to the bugs as the sun goes down. And when she wakes, she would only have to kick her legs up into the pale clouds and breathe a breakfast of morning sun. This is Yellowbird. She loves yellow. She has yellow days, is going through a yellow period. But unlike the artists, she is never unhappy. She loves the heat, welcomes each summer day like a guest to our house. She believes it's her job to pick the dandelions. It's a gentle massacre. She is a golden head in a sea of honey, and she likes how they stay so yellow even when they are dead. I have to always read that one, and I have to um, make sure everyone knows that that's Rowan's favorite. Rowan is my youngest daughter, and that's the poem about her. So it's Rowan's little poem. I, I think I might have to rename it. All right. Another park poem. This is from a little bit more into my childhood. As the book progresses, we kind of descend into the, the early 90s, complete with all the glam rock music that I think is very important. Whenever you're going to the early 90s, you have to um, get a good tolerance for really easy rhymes and bad music. Um, so this is Peanut Park. The girls know the play structure at Peanut Park is old. They can count its years by the history cut into it. It's top like a fort, they sink inside. Shadows thick and clammy, where no one can see them if they want to smoke. The walls with names, dates, hearts, swears burned into the wood, ruins of a different age. They read them out loud and wonder about who made them and if they too sat here, passing around a single cigarette. So another part of the book is, I did a really beautiful thing when I was editing this, and I, I had a bunch of poems that were mine, and they were all, I called them the I poems. They all started with I, I, I. Po poets are like that, right? We're really I, I, I people. Um, and then I had a bunch of poems about looking out to other people, and they were she. And one of the things I did while editing is I made them, I took the eyes and I made it third person. So everyone became a she. And it was a really brilliant um, feeling for me. Um, I don't know if it was brilliant overall, but it was brilliant for me because it became, it did everything I wanted it to. It really let me have some distance to all this I-ness and it really made all the poems about me interchangeable with the poems about other people. So we all got to kind of, I got to hide in, in the midst of this. One of the stories that I needed a little distance in telling was the story of my brother, um, which is the story of November. Um, yeah, so the, the, the quick story you know, again, we're going to descend into the de the down. We're going to go on a little downer, and then we're going to come back up later. Um, the story of my brother is is uh, he he went missing when I, he was 18 and I was 14, and uh, what happened? He was missing for about six months. He went to the bar with his friends, and he went to he got a little inebriated as we sometimes do when we go to the bar, especially when we're 18, and then the 
hy hypothesis is that he tried to cross the river that wasn't frozen and fell in. Um, the tragedy of this was not only his death, but the fact that at the time it wasn't really paid attention to. We tried to get a lot of media attention and there, there, we didn't have much luck with that because of where we were, because of who he was. He was a young indigenous man from the wrong side of the, the tracks in the river. Um, what's neat for me is that now that this book has received so much blessed attention that I still can't wrap my brain around, um, now his story is, is quite well known um, to people, and I, I find that amazing um, because it's, it's all, all we can do is, is honor these people, right? These people that we lost, and all we can do is tell their stories and hope people will listen. So this is a little bit of November. Picture. One. In the front hallway, his sister watches him tie his shoes, a foot propped on the small stool. He wears jeans the color of snow, a jacket blue and thin, even though it is such a cold November. He wears a black concert t-shirt, bright writing with an eagle clutching a large peace sign in its claws. Two. He tosses and feathers his soft black hair with thin brown hands, checks his reflection in the mirror. His sister asks him to borrow a sweater. He hesitates, teases, finally says, fine. He turns at the door, smirks and waves. The wind pushes his hair over his face and he is gone. Three. Her mother picks several pictures to put in the newspaper, different ones showing different things, multiple profiles. But the newspaper takes the one with his hat hung low, half his face in shadow. The headline reads, Native Man Missing After Binge. She cuts it in two, folds it in two. She cuts it out, folds it in two, puts it in the photo album. She thinks he would like it that they called him a man. Okay, one more. Because I always like to have, bring it up a little bit, you know. Um, it feels sad. But it's also beautiful, right? We worked through the sad, now we're at the beautiful. We're going to be okay. Heavy metal ballads. Her brother is beautiful. Hair brushed gently across shoulders like newly born bird feathers. So soft, but the downy black could never be touched. He has tight jeans, concert t-shirts, and smirks practiced in front of mirrors perfected to cover every silver tooth. Her brother is heavy metal ballads, a thin ripple bass line, a long, slow current of guitar, a smooth wave of lyrics you always remember.